Now on. I'm on. Well, welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here in uh, Yucca, First Southern Baptist Church of Yucca, <laughs> Light in the Desert Church of Yucca. And we are in the second, and we're going to finish the third chapter of Hosea tonight. Now, the, the third chapter is only five verses. So. Hosea wasn't written uh, in chapter, that's the word I want. Uh, the chapters don't always line up with what God is saying, so you have to kind of uh, give them half of the chapter and then pick up the other half where God's saying one thing and stays constant. What happened was last week we studied the uh, angry outpouring of the heart of God as he, as he witnessed the actions of his people Israel, right? Well, that was that was 2, 1 through 13. And then right after that, after God has pretty much read them the riot act and told them what he's going to do to them, how he's going to take them, uh, and they're going to be put into captivity. <clears throat> Actually, this is the northern tribes that we're talking about. Assyria is going to swoop down and capture them, take them back to Assyria. And God was even going to pull his uh, Sabbaths, his feast days, he's going to make them unrecognizable as Israel. So that was chapters 2, 1 through 13. But the God that we serve, th this, these are his people, are they not? Just like we are his people. And what we were talking about sin earlier today. God is a gracious God. And, uh, you know, even a deliberate sin. I know this goes against what you were saying there. Even a deliberate sin can be forgiven. In fact, does, do you know the difference between a trespass and a sin? Anybody? When you planned. A trespass is a planned sin. Mm -hmm. And we were all dead in our sins and trespasses. Yeah. A, uh, we sin on a constant basis. We are born into sin, but we trespass on our own validity. Okay, so both are a trespass is a sin. Don't get me wrong, uh, but it's a plan. Yeah. So the question we were talking about can can you for, can a plan of sin be forgiven? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, we were talking. It's kind of like me trying not to smoke. I keep trying and trying and trying. To, I know it's a sin against the body, but I'm still doing it so that the trespass because it's still a will a plan of sin. Yeah, I you're, plan on hitting that cigarette when I get out the door. Yeah, and you're, you're a pretty bad person. I, yeah. we, we pretty much know that. <laughs> Can you talk to my wife? <laughs> you're just trying to meet God earlier than all of us. <laughs> oh, that's plan too. I <laughs> God, God knows us, and uh, He knows our hearts, and He knows everything about more than we know about ourselves. That's a good thing. But anyway, um, God loves us and he's faithful, okay? And God is acting here in, this, in these scriptures as a faithful husband and as a husband would love his wife, okay? Even though the particular wife we're talking about here in this Israel, Israel was doing all these things knowing their sins were actual trespasses. They knew what they were supposed to do and didn't do it, okay? And that this was over really thousands of years. But, so God calls them unfaithful. Uh, and he calls them, these people who are unfaithful, he calls them harlots, okay? Just as, um, as they go off to worship their pagan God, these are descendants of the people who saw the Red Sea parted who ate the manna for 40 years in the desert. They've seen the miracles of God before their very eyes. They might even have somebody in the family, an elderly man that was there when they parted the Red Sea. You know, this is uh, not that far down the, down the road from the parting of the Red Sea. I believe it's 600, 650 years from the time this was written, Hosea to uh, Moses. But anyway, in verse 2 through 13 of last week we studied, we read 
the charges that God brought against Israel. Remember that? <clears throat> that picture last week was a picture of a courtroom. And a courtroom setting was the charges were read. Just like we go into a courtroom right now and, and uh, the charges against the defendant are going to be read. Well, such was the case with the laws of Israel. They had a different way of doing it. But uh, the man who had a, a wife who was a harlot, he was able to go into a courtroom setting, accuse her, uh, and God's doing basically the same thing with Israel. First, God states that she is not my wife. A man would walk into a courtroom, who, Hosea, for example, could walk into this courtroom setting, uh, which in those days, a lot of the courtrooms met right outside the city gate. That was where the town hall was, was set. <clears throat> She is not my wife. And then he says, and I am not her husband. And his rights under the law, remember last week, was to strip her naked. He could do that. That was one of the options. He could strip her naked in front of the people. Uh, and, or he could punish her. Or I'm sorry. Or he could even have her and her lover put to death. If... Um, you read in, in the travels of Moses, when that first happened in the camp, that's exactly what happened. The man and the woman were both put to death. Um, or, there's another option. Do you remember at Christmas time we read the story about Mary and Joseph, and Joseph was planning to quietly put her away. That was another option, okay, under the law of Moses. Or God could, under the law, punish her by putting her away keeping her away from her lover and thereby causing her to want to return to her husband and love only him. I'm not exactly sure how they would go about doing that. Sounds like locking her up. Yeah, it sounds almost like locking her up, but uh, there's options available to, to, and that's one of the options that's available, putting her away quietly. You could send her off to a distant country, to relatives or whatever, uh, where she couldn't be around the having the affair, or whatever, whatever the situation was. This was the opinion that God chose, though, to use with his unfaithful wife, Israel. God chose to put her away. But when God puts you away, you got to watch out. He's not going to put you in a nice place. God put her away in the land of Assyria uh, under the leadership of a man by the name of Sennacherib. Sennacherib was famous for skinning people alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, us and but he caused her to go into captivity into the land of Assyria, and there she lost her identity. This was the big thing. There she lost her identity. God says, you'll no longer have your Sabbaths. You will no longer have your feast days. You will no longer have your new moons. All the things that are indicative to the nation Israel. You're not going to have that anymore. And of course, we know that 200 and some, I'm sorry, 700 years later, uh, this group of people was complete, were completely and totally unrecognizable. They were called uh, Samaritans. And they were a mix of Jew and, well, Gentile, basically Gentile. Because the, the Assyrians weren't necessarily intermarrying with them, but the Assyrians were out capturing a lot of other countries as well. And they would bring some of the captives and they would drop them off in the in the land of Samaria, which was the northern tribe. They took a bunch back into uh, a group of them, most of them actually, back into Assyria. And they probably put them in other places in, in the known world at that time too. But, but at any rate, that was the people who was in the land of Samaria when Jesus walked the face there. They were called Samaritans. Uh, now, God still loves them, does he not? Yep. Are they not his children? Yep. Yeah. 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 Is, this, is this a final goodbye from God? Because no. God, God does, did that with a lot of um, nations. You know, the Canaanites don't exist anymore. God wiped them out. In fact, he wanted Israel to wipe them out. Uh, there's, uh, when he destroyed the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, there's no Sodomites laid around anymore. He destroyed them completely and totally. He didn't restore them. But this is God's children. These are God's, this is God's family. And he's punishing them in a godly way. 
And so all of this will one day change. God is one day will call his people back. Now, how is he going to do that? How is God going to do that when they've intermingled? Uh, most of the people don't even know if they're from the tribe of Ephraim or from the tribe, uh, what tribe they're from, especially the ten tribes that got taken into captivity. <coughs> but you know who does know? God knows. God knows. That's right. There's a scripture in Genesis where God looked down on a man uh, and this is some ten generations from creation looked down on the man by the name of Noah and while everybody was going off into the uh, family of Cain intermarrying he looked down he found one person who was if you read the scripture it says he was perfect in his generations I know that, that I know that I know that there are uh, Israeli perfect in their generation people and who knows that might be how God puts together his 144,000 I don't know okay but I know that God does know I know one thing don't buy into this we are not Ephraim okay that's out there we're not Ephraim and the church never replaced Israel uh, I know there's people that believe that but uh, a lot of people because of this happening that where they went north and they disappeared they went into countries like uh, Ireland there's a lot of Jer <coughs> Jeremiah's Jeremy's coming from Ireland Daniel's coming from Ireland uh, so they think that um, and, and I know they did they, they went that way they migrated that way uh, when they were when they were captured but that doesn't mean that that in this day that that's going to uh, make them or the nation the United States Ephraim nor do I believe that uh, the church is Ephraim okay that would now do I believe that there's some people in the United States that are true Jews Ephraim uh, uh, from the tribe of Manasseh uh, you know, any of any of those ten tribes that went north they could be in our midst right now, but not as a group. So let's leave that for a minute. Uh, they will, God will one day call them back. Where is he going to call them back to? What was the promise given by God? Israel. Oh, oh, oh. A land. God, was prom God promised them a land. The nation of Israel is promised a land. What is the promise to the church? Heaven. We are, we are the bride of Christ. And that's another reason to not buy into the Ephraim story. If you're Israel, you're going to a land. That's God's promise to those people. If you're in the church, you are the bride of Christ. And the Bible says that we are to forever be with the Lord. Wherever he is, that's where we're going to be. Because we're the bride of Christ. Um, uh, with God and with his people, his punishment will always be savored with grace and mercy. Okay? God can never allow sin to go unpunished, but God's punishment always points to restoration. And that's kind of the topic of tonight. The very top, God's restoration of Israel. Last week we looked at the crime and the punishment. Tonight we're going to look at the day of restoration. And, and that's why I've split it up. And by the way, as we go through this Hosea, uh, we've got 14 chapters to get through as we go through it you're going to see the same pattern uh, next week it's all going to be about the bad things Israel's done then, then we're going to take a break from that we're going to go back and talk about how God's going to punish them for it which is the same punishment they're going to go into uh, captivity but how God's going to bring them back again and of course when we're talking about God bringing them back again we're talking about the years in which we now live this, this was uh, 722 B.C. and Sennacherib came against uh, the northern tribes of Israel. But I'm talking about in the year 2021, right now is the time that the restoration is taking place. Let's read Hosea 14 and 15. 
2, 14 and 15. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. While in the wilderness, he's going to speak comfort to her. I will give her vineyards from there. Okay? And the valley of Achor as a door of hope. We can talk about that. She, the, she shall sing there, as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up from the land of Egypt. There is, of course, Assyria. Okay, or wherever they're going to be dropped off on the bus to Assyria. Anyone in the land. Said God will allure her there. That's an interesting word, that allure. In this verse, God uses romantic language, and he says that he would allure her. He's not going to drive her back to him. He's not going to drag her back to him. He's not going to force her to come back. He's going to allure her. Uh, remember, Israel has been worshiping at, at the altar of Baal and giving credit to Baal for their, their vineyards, for their weed, and... and uh, they basically have forgotten about God. Yeah, they forgot about God. They've given all the credit to a God who's no God at all. Um, God's going to look so good in the eyes of these people who are taking, going into captivity that they're going to want to come back. First, they're going to want to come back because Assyria is not going to be a nice place for them to live. Okay, They're going to want to come back home uh, or wherever they're going to be dropped off. They're not going to like it. But somehow God's going to speak to them. I don't know how he's going to do that. He's going to speak to them, and he's going to let them know that there are vineyards available. There's, there's wheat fields available. He's going to allure them to come back and go, wow. It's, it's kind of like the, the early Israelites wanting to go back to Egypt. The devil was trying to allure them. This is a trick of the devil. The devil uses the same strategy when he draws us away using the pleasures of this world. Is this the same like the people now that God's wanting to go back to Israel, but they're not going because they don't, in other words, they don't consider Israel their own, but uh, God wants the Jews to go back to Israel right now before the end, end times. Mm -hmm. He's wanting them to go back. God wants them to go back. We started a lot of that work yeah. in Zechariah and in Haggai. Yeah. So and this is what the luring, the luring but not forcing them. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and remember, they're still, they're still in um, captivity. Mm -hmm. they never, they've never come back. But God's going to allure them, and he's going to speak to them. But it's, it's going to be the, the Jew that I believe whose generations... Um, are, are true. That God's going to allure those people. He's going to bring Ephraim. Ephraim is another word for Israel. He's going to bring all of Ephraim back into the land. Uh, so there might be somebody sitting over here in the United States that's doing really well, but all of a sudden his heart, God changes that person's heart. He wants to go back. He has Jewish roots. He knows he does. He may not know what, what family or what tribe he came from, but God's going to allure them back. And in the end times, yes, God's going to have them all back in the land. But, in God, the land. but Satan's going to use the world as the captivity to yeah. keep them out. Yeah. That's yeah. the captivity. I could never argue that the United States is not full of Ephraimites, okay? Israelites. I could never win that argument because we are. That people that don't even know that they're Israelites. But that doesn't mean that this is true Israel, or the church is true Israel. That would, that would say that everybody gets saved is as Ephraim roots. That's just not the case. So, um, somehow, in some way, God's going to give these people a hope of returning. Exactly what we're talking about. God now says that he would give them vineyards from there. Uh, remember, God always speaks in the present. Okay? Everything is, is present tense with the Lord. Uh, he's, not out, he's not in time. Uh, he's, he doesn't have any past, or he's not really talking about in the future. God's seeing everything right then and there. 
Uh, so maybe he's talking to people and has been for thousands and thousands of years, but he's talking in the present. He's going to draw them back in the present. And that, and he says, he would bring them through the Valley of Achor. I looked up what that Valley of Achor is. It's actually um, the area. Is everybody familiar with the story of Achan? No. No? No? Okay. When, when the Jews crossed the Jordan with Joshua, the first battle was a place called Jericho. Mm -hmm. And of course, they took Jericho uh, with, with God's help. Mm -hmm. so Joshua didn't fight the battle of Jericho. Jo Joshua walked around and around and around, and the walls came tumbling down, okay? God fought the battle of Jericho. And God made it perfectly clear that when they went in, they were to take absolutely 0, 0.0.0 plunder. You know, they didn't win the battle, they had nothing coming. Um, however, a man by the name of Achan decided to take some of the plunder. So the next battle was a battle called Ai, uh, this next city that they had to take. And they went up there like they were mighty men again, they, they were on, God was on their side, and they got their tail kicked back, all the way back to the Jordan River. Um, so Joshua sought the Lord, and, and found out that there was sin in the camp. You've heard that expression, there's sin in the camp? Well, that comes from the story of Achan. And this was all done in the valley that we're talking about. It became known as the Valley of Achor, which is another translation of Achan. Um, and let's see, yeah. Achan was the one who took spoils from the city of Jericho, causing God's wrath to fall on the nation of Israel after that famous battle. Now, God's going to transform that valley, which then became known as the Valley of Trouble, because when they were in the valley, nothing good was happening to the nation of Israel. So it became known as the Valley of Achor, which translates the Valley of Trouble. Uh, God's going to transform that valley, if you flip back to the page, it says, and the Valley of Achor shall be a door of hope. They're going to come in through that door of hope, that same valley, I wish I could tell you where it was. I could have done more research. But God's going to bring people through that valley. It's now going to be a valley, a, a door of hope instead of a valley of trouble. There in that valley, she, Israel, will sing, is what it just said. There you will sing in that valley. Thus, when Israel arrives through the door of hope, they will be restored to joy. We know that that door of hope is definitely in the land of Israel. So, yes. It will be drawing the people back into mm -hmm. that land. It's, a, it, it's the same picture. Yeah. Right, same That's picture. That's what's going on right now. The true pleasure of God will replace the past pleasures of sin. Israel, and again, another name for Israel is Ephraim. I, I use that interchangeably because the Bible uses that word interchangeably. Sometimes we read it along and they're talking about the nation. Israel, which, but the northern tribe of Israel was denoted as Ephraim, which Ephraim, of course, is one of Joseph's sons. Uh, Israel will repent and serve God, their husband. Now let's look at the verse below. They're going to come back. Remember what, remember what God wants them to do? It says he's going to allure them back. Right now, it, it's looking so nice in Israel. I mean, it's a flesh country. And God's going to allure them back. Uh, their countrymen can be there. And God's going to bring them back to, to be with their countrymen. God's going to bring, for well, whatever reason, God's going to touch the hearts of Ephraim all over the world and draw them back into the land. And it shall be in that day. Well, I love it when we talk about that day. Because we are living in <coughs> that day. We're living in, if not exactly that day, we're living in a prelude to that day. These, these shots that people are, are taking are not that far off from uh, a time when you're going to have to take a number. Okay? I have said for many, many years, Sandy will back me up, that that uh, number 666. It says right in the Bible, this is the number of man. What makes man a man is a thing called DNA. 
Our DNA is uniquely different from the DNA of a monkey, a dog, a cat, and some number of man. And I said that 30 years ago, didn't I, Bob? Now we see people not wanting to get the shots. I'm not going to go too deep on this. Uh, because of a thing called messenger RNA. Uh, messenger RNA is, is, is that part of RNA that gives instructions, okay? It can send out signals, if you will. And a lot of people are believing that there's something in that shot because they're using messenger RNA to give you the shot. Uh, and so people are afraid of it that are familiar with messenger RNA. Uh, I believe that someday that our DNA will all be categorized. It already is, by the way. If you've committed a crime, you have more than fingerprints sitting down there at the FBI's office. Your DNA is available. You're uh, on Ancestry. Ancestry. Yeah, that's right. And they that's they right. can find out if one of your relatives killed somebody 30 years ago. That's right. <laughs> a lot of cold cases are being revised so, because of DNA. And mDNA DNA is uh, just kind of a scary thing. Uh, okay. But anyway, uh, how are we going to transform them in this? Oh, wait, where are they? Uh, and it shall be. And it shall be in that day. And that's the day we're living in, okay? And that's the day when, uh, when we, at some point, that day is going to turn into a thing called the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob, of course, was renamed Israel. And, of course, that means, another way of saying it, there's going to come in a time of Israel's trouble, okay? That's going to be the time that God's going to really talk to the nation Israel. But first he's going to lure them back. That you will call me my husband and no longer call me master. During the great tribulation, God's going to do a great and mighty work in the nation of Israel. Now I'm talking about the entire nation of Israel. How do I know that? Because if you read chapter 7 of, of Revelation, you'll see that God's going to take 12,000 from each tribe. So he's going to have to know a few Ephraimites. He's going to have to know, uh, 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 I can't name all the tribes, but uh, tribes from the tribe yeah. of Dan, tribes from the, and all the different tribes that God's going to call them from. Uh, and he's going to take 12,000 from each one of those tribes taking 144,000 total Jews. These are not Christians, but they're Jews. But they're going to be protected by Jesus Christ during that great tribulation period. And by the way, they are the only people that will be protected during that period of time, during the great tribulation. Everybody else, it's a great tribulation. Okay? Will they know? Hmm? Will they know they're chosen? Yes. Yes, they're going to know they're chosen. Um, it's interesting here it says and it shall be in that day says the Lord that you shall call me my husband and no longer call me my master that's kind of interesting we'll talk about it for I will take from her mouth the names of Baal and they shall be remembered by their name no more remember Baal is their, their God that they've been in, in this story that's that's Israel's lover, okay? Uh, in that day I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, with the birds of the air, and with the creeping things of the ground. Bow and sword of battle I will shatter from the earth. See, now we're moving way past Jacob's trouble to make them lie down safely. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in loving kindness, in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. So they become brides of Christ also? No. <clears throat> no. We're talking about a period of time. <clears throat> you can read about it in Ezekiel. You can read about it in Zechariah, and even in Malachi, where we just call it. When Jesus sits on the throne of David, uh, the church knows that period of time as the millennial reign of Christ. We as the church will be serving Jesus because we are the bride of Christ. We will be uh, previously raptured and taken out of here, but we will return, I believe, in our glorified bodies, I think. 
This is, this is my belief. But Israel will be here in their regular bodies. And they're going to be here for a thousand years. And they're going to be doing all the right things in the temple of God. They're, they're going to finally get on board with God's program for their nation. And during that period of time, says the Lord, you will call me my husband. It's going to be a love affair between God. I'm not just talking about Jesus. Oh, I'm talking about right. God, That's not the Jesus. Sick, it's still, right. it's still referring to God the Father. And, and notice, who, look at this at the um, whenever. Okay, very last line. And you shall know the L O R D. You see that printed there, the very bottom, L O R D. Whenever you see that, that translates as Yahweh, uh, the Great I Am. It is the covenant name of God. Not, not the Son, okay? Not the Holy Spirit, not that they're not the all God, but the collective Godhead, okay? The collective Godhead, and the collective Godhead had, and always have, has had, a covenant, a deal, a, a contract, uh, a testament with L-O-R-D. That's, that's what, now when we get to... Uh, no, stay with it. Rabbit trap. Okay. And you're not going to call me uh, master. When, this sounds a little strange, uh, God doesn't want to be called master. I've tried it with Sandy a few times, but she doesn't want to call me master either. Um, I've tried sir. Uh, she's not laughing. Um, <laughs> But with a false god, in the false god, they would call their false god master. We see this in a lot of movies of Satanism, the master, master. God doesn't want to be master. He wants to be husband, okay? He wants a love affair with his people. He said, no longer will you, no longer you call me master. I don't want to be your master. I will take from your mouth the names of all the Baals, because there's a lot of Baals. There's a lot of false gods out there. Exactly. And you won't even, they shall be remembered by their name and no more. Right. Not even going to talk about your false gods, okay? Because God's going to restore them. They've been in punishment. God's going to bring them back. Uh, now you say, wait a minute. This is at least 2,700 years ago. Those people are all dead and gone. Yeah. But God's talking collectively about the nation. He's not talking about the individuals. We covered a little bit of that on Sunday. Remember, I told you what prophecy is. You know, prophecy and this nation, the nation we're living in right now, is going to go into some form of uh, disarray. We're, this this nation will go through what we call the Great Tribulation. Doesn't mean that the individuals will. If if you are a child of God, God's got a different plan for the individuals. But uh, collectively, the entire world will go into that tribulation. And in that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beast of the field, okay, with the birds of the air, and with the creeping things of the ground. Now, God's going to change. Now, right now, if you approach a rattlesnake, most likely that rattlesnake is going to bite you. That should do like Joe and I did with the shotgun, okay? So... Uh, it's, it's better if you approach the rattlesnake carefully. But there's coming a time during, during the millennial reign of Christ uh, where uh, if God's going to make them lie down and say, that will be true, probe you to me forever. Yes, this is forever. Yes, how long is forever? Forever. Ever. Eternity. In righteousness and justice, God's going to love them through eternity and mercy. I will be true you to me in my faithfulness, and you shall know L-O-R-D. <coughs> we get down and explain that a little bit more. Well, that means there's going to be animals. It means the animals are going to live in harmony oh, yeah. with mankind. Say, but there's still going to be animals on this earth. Huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The difference is they're not going to be wild animals that want to eat you. Uh, in fact, we're going to read this. Uh, but remember this Roman numeral three now, page three. Remember, as this event plays out throughout the history of northern country of Israel, it's also being realized in the real life of Hosea, 
and his wife back home, Gomer. Okay? Everything that God is saying concerning the nation of Israel is happening day by day in real time through real lives. Remember, back in the land of northern Israel, before all this happened, God sent Hosea in to play out this drama in a real life situation. Hey, Hosea, go take for yourself a harlot as a wife and tell me how it feels. By the way, go tell everybody out there in, in the village how it feels. Now, let them see your, your, your sadness. As God looks forward to a day when Israel will call me husband, so also Hosea was looking forward to a day when Gomer would return unto him and call him my husband. Remember, we talked about this in the first, first chapter. This is a love story, a love story between God and Israel and a love story between uh, Hosea and his wife Gomer. Has she sinned against her husband? Yes, she has. Uh, but we're going to see some. As we go through, you're going to see what happens in Hosea's life. Just as Hosea desired an intimate love with Gomer, so also God desires that same relationship with his people. In both cases, the desired uh, end would be a, quote, true marriage. Remember we talked about the uh, principle of least interest? That when there's two people in a relationship and one person doesn't have any interest in that relationship working, that's a dead relationship. God was in a uh, relationship with the principle of least interest. He, but God has certain ways to make this stuff work out, as we see. He's going to take them into captivity. He's going to make, he's going to allure them and bring them back in into that way. And then they will call him a true, my husband, be a true marriage. A true marriage does not have a master. God did not want his people relating to him as a as would a servant relating to a master. God wants to be husband. In actuality, the word Baal means exactly that. It means master. Okay? In Hebrew, uh, master and Baal are synonymous. God did not want to be Israel's new lover or master. He wanted a relationship. This relationship would be based on love and commitment. Also with this restored relationship, God would even erase the memory of the former involvement with the false god of Baal. And he would insert the new relationship of husband and wife rather than master and slave. Now, we can go chunka 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 down the road 2,700 years to the day in which we're living. And like, and let's just say that there's plenty of Ephraimites living in our community, right here in, in Yucca, okay? Uh, and when God calls them back to the land of Israel, okay, they're not going to remember Baal, are they? No. All this is fulfilled prophecy. They're not even going to remember the, the reason why they're an Ephraimite, even if they even know that they are an Ephraimite until they maybe got selected to be one of the 144,000 or whatever. They're, oh, I'm from Ephraim, or I'm from... Uh, Naphtali, I'm, I'm from Dan, I'm from whatever tribe they might be coming from. Uh, they're not going to know, maybe. They, they just know they, they're come, being called back to the nation, uh, what we now call Israel. We need to identify now the term in that day. That day is not a day. That day is a future time when the Messiah will rule planet Earth. We've been talking about this already. As a righteous king. We, the church, call this day the 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ. That day begins at the end of the Great Tribulation. Oh, by the way, the Jew has the same day, but they call that day the reign of the Messiah. Okay? That's what it's called in, in the Jewish. Uh, that day begins at the end of the Great Tribulation. In that day, many things will change. Not only, and that day is a time period. That day is not a day. That day is a time period. I believe that day goes for at least a thousand years. Okay? Some people want to even take that day into the new heavens and the new earth because it does continue on. Uh, not only for Israel, but for the inhabitants of all planet Earth. Things are going to change during the millennial reign of Christ during the messianic age, during the age of the Messiah, whatever you want to call it. There will be no more war. 
why, why is it not going to be more war? Because Jesus Christ can be sitting on the throne of planet Earth. Anybody know what where his throne's going to be seated at? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Oh, you do well, grasshopper. Yeah. <laughs> Beast of no longer attack people. Beast of the field will no longer attack people. Listen, here, here's Isaiah. This is Isaiah 11, 6 through 10. The wolf shall also dwell with the lamb. That's not happening right now. The leopard shall lie down with the, the young goat. Not going to eat them. The calf and the young lion and the fatting cat and the fatling together. And the little child shall lead in them. And the cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. Doing a lot of time teaching the kids not to hang around rattlesnakes, but and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountains. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In other words, as simple as the water covering the sea, so shall as that's true, uh, so shall the earth be full of the knowledge of the Lord. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse. Who's that? Jesus. Thank you. Who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall also seek him. That's us. That's the Gentiles. Okay? Shall also seek him. And his resting place shall be glorious. That was Isaiah. Running parallel to what we're studying tonight. That period of time, uh, we're going to be there. We are going to be there during that period of time. If you read the 20th chapter of Revelation, you'll see that we're going to be there. Government workers, right, Barbara? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Retired. <laughs> I don't know if you can extend that at retirement into that. I'm not sure. I'm working on it. Okay. Finally, verses 19 and 20, we are told of a marriage that will be restored to me forever. This marriage was at one time a one-sided relationship, but now will be two equally yoked partners, a man and God, Israel and the Lord. It will never again be broken. Yes, it will have taken 6,000 years. That's the time between creation and perfection. Uh, but in the end, God says that he will betroth you to me in faithfulness. Now we're talking here about the nation Israel. okay? And specifically in this particular book, we are talking about the northern portion of the nation Israel. Okay? We're talking about Ephraim, the ten tribes that went into captivity. But in the end, the two will be together. Uh, God will draw them back. It will be Ephraim with uh, Ephraim will be with Judah. Um, God says that He would betroth you to Me in faithfulness. Faithfulness is not a word that you could ever use or has ever been applied to the nation Israel. They're not faithful even to this day. If you go over to Israel today, you might find a few people walking around with some yarmulkes, uh, but it's the little hats that they have on their head. Uh, but mostly you find a westernized country, a country that God's just as sick of as he is the United States of America right now. Uh, <clears throat> but in the end, this is the word that's applied to the former harlot, faithful. The former harlot's going to become faithful, and she shall know the Lord. Hosea 2, 21 through 23. It shall come to pass in that day that I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth. In other words, here's what's going to happen. The earth shall answer with grain, with new wine and oil. Uh, the fields are going to come back alive again. Uh, got the picture here with the lion lying down with the, with the lamb. That, we just read that in Isaiah. You'll see the, the green 
tree back there, the olive tree. That's an olive tree. And see how green it is. Uh, Israel's going to come back alive again. Then I will sow her for, they shall answer Jezreel. I want to talk a little bit about Jezreel because Jezreel keeps got, getting brought up in the book of Hosea. When we first studied Jezreel, it was as a punishment because the word Jezreel means to scatter. Okay, but Jezreel to scatter also means to plant. Okay, because when you as when you plant seeds. So here in this meaning, they shall answer Jezreel. Uh, it's mean that the the earth will answer Jezreel, and you're going to scatter the seeds, and the seeds are going to uh, give forth the crop. And it says again, new with grain, with new wine, with oil, and you can see the picture of the green. Green tree, that's Israel. Then I will sow her for myself in the earth. The earth, the land of Israel and God are intertwined. They, they are, they're inseparable. That, that's why God wants to call his people back to the land. Just as heaven uh, is, is tied to the the church, so the land is tied to Israel. And in that land, I still got some time. I gotta take a little rabbit trail. This my pillow guy, well like uh, he has this advertisement for his Giza dream sheets. Do you does anybody remember when we were studying the uh, uh, Genesis and I gave you a map of the land of Goshen? No, we are not if you still got that map, if you see one of those commercials, put, hit the pause button and put that map over where where that uh, where Giza is today. Okay, it used to be called the land of Goshen. It's right where the Nile River comes out into the Mediterranean Sea, and it's some of the most fertile land in the world. In the world. Yeah. And another thing that people don't realize. Doug and I discovered this together, didn't we, Doug? Yeah. That is actually, if you read the boundaries of the promised land, that is actually part of the given promised land. So where Mike Lind uh, Lindell, is that yeah. Lindell, Mike Lindell is getting his dream sheets, his part is from the land of promise. He's going to have to give it back uh, here pretty soon. Right now it belongs to Egypt. I don't think he cares. <laughs> I don't think so either. <laughs> I have some of his sheets, you know. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, I, that's interesting. Uh, they shall answer Jezreel. That's the scattering of the seeds. They shall sow in, sow her for myself in the earth, and I will have mercy on her who I had not, who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who were not my people, "You are my people," and they shall say, "You are my God." Hmm. Yeah, a little. The Apostle Paul writes to the saints in Rome, explain to them that the condition of man is also the condition of earth. Okay? You guys have already finished chapter 8 of, of Romans, correct? Mm -hmm. Oh, in there, God talks about how the earth is groaning, awaiting the. Oh, I wrote it down for you. For the, <laughs> sorry. For creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself, that's the earth, and, and, and the universe, which, by the way, check with the scientist. He'll tell you that this universe is decaying. Uh, a good scientist will tell you that the universe is winding down. Okay? Um, as it should. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we all, we who also have the first fruits of the Spirit, that's us, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. When that time comes, when, when this earth has gone through its entire uh, process, okay, and during the reign of the Messiah, after, I believe, that time we will be raptured, 
this earth is going to begin to change. We know it changes for sure at the end of the 1,000 year millennial reign of Christ. And because this earth will be destroyed by fire and and then there's going to be a really neat remodeling job. I don't know how God's going to do it, but somehow the, the people of God come through it unscathed, just like in the flood, just like in the flood, and all of a sudden John looks down, he saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the former things had passed away, and everything had been made new. By the way, up to the end of the thousand-year millennium, you think, wow, everything's going to be great during the thousand-year millennium reign of Christ. It will be for us. It will be for the, for the uh, Israelites who are now following the proper ways of God. But there's a whole world out there. We studied it. We studied Zechariah chapter 14. Remember uh, that, hey, if th these people don't come up to Jerusalem, somehow get there by, uh, uh, what's that, where you scope and come on Zoom. Maybe they can go there by Zoom or something. I don't know how God's going to do it. But everybody's called to go there for Sukkot, for the Feast of the Tabernacles. And if they don't go there to worship the Lord, uh, God's going to cause them not to reign on their land. He's gonna, he has punishment, even during that period of, of good and plenty. God's going to punish people who don't want to follow him. So not everybody's going to like this guy called Jesus Christ, who's sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. And in fact... After a thousand years, the enemy is released for a short period of time, raises a whole nother army, and what do they do? They come against the saints there at Jerusalem. And of course, God's had it. The next words is, there, he saw heaven and earth fleeing from, from one who sat on the throne, and there was found no place for them. That was God's last, uh, that was the last straw with God. That's a thousand years from now. If, if we're raptured tonight, that's still a thousand years of man being on this planet in, in his uh, regular body. That's why I don't believe that we will. I believe we will come back in our glorified body. We'll get that when we are raptured. But anyway, that's what I'm trying. Uh, when the Messiah sits on the throne of David and rules the earth, the heavens shall answer the earth. During the time of captivity and isolation, the earth had dried up. Um, but now the rain will return, the grain will grow, the vineyards will blossom, and the oil, olive oil, shall return. They shall answer Jezreel, which simply means the seed will once again be scattered. The God who gave them the land will return them to the land. God sees Israel and the land as one. I've already said that. Thus the meaning of, then I will sow her for myself in the earth is made clear. <clears throat> in the end, or should I say, in the new beginning, God will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Remember Hosea uh, and Gomer's uh, middle born? It was, a, it was a girl, and they named her uh, Lo Ruhama, which was to say to Israel, I'm not going to show you any mercy. Now, if you're one of those people for the last 2,700 years who has been cast out, taken through all the, the nations of the world, you, you might say, well, God never showed us any mercy. But in the end day, in that day, God's going to uh, say to them, I will have mercy on you. However, restoration changes everything, doesn't it? Yep. And the God of mercy can now boldly state that he will have mercy. Also, because the restoration and of, of his great mercy, he will say to the people who he once previously said to, you are not my people. Remember that the second son's name was Lo Ami. Remember that? Which means not. Lo means not. And Ami means my people. Uh, Ruhama means mercy. And Ami means my people. He had Lo, Ruhama, no mercy. And he had... Uh, the other son, the, other, the third born son was called Lo Ami, not my people. And in that same place, he's going to say, you are my people. While this is all really good, the most amazing statement is that through God's plan of restoration, the people can say what? You are now my God. As we know, the end of everything shall be as such. In Revelation 21.3, it says this way, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, 
Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. How does all this happen? It happens when they accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. We got into that in great detail in, in Malachi and Hosea. I mean, uh, Zechariah. Now I want to read to you just 3, 1 through 5. There's not a lot of study here, but I want you to see the parallel. Now we're going to talk about Hosea. Then the Lord said to me, this is Hosea speaking, Go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who took, who looked to other gods to, and loved the, the ra raisin cakes of the pagans. This is what she was like. This is Homer. So I bought her for myself. This is what he did. So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver, and one and one half homers of barley. Evidently, uh, Gomer had fallen into some yeah, sort of debt and, and was taken in by one of her lovers. So she had to be bought back. Isn't that exactly what Jesus Christ did for us on the yeah, cross? Yeah. That he paid the penalty for our sin. He paid a price that we couldn't pay. Yep. Okay. Well, that's what homers not Homer. That's what Hosea is doing for Gomer. And I said to her, You shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So too I will be toward you. So he buys her back. Now he's got possession, total possession of her. He has bought her back. Okay? It's not just a simple, you're my husband. Okay? But that's what he wants. But isn't that what God did too? It didn't, didn't God go back and buy Israel back? Yeah. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without king or prince. They were sent to uh, now we're going to talk about Israel. <coughs> without sacrifice or sacred pillar. Without ephod or teraphim. In other words, they lost their identity as Israel. Afterwards, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness. When? In the latter days. If you ever want to know when the latter days are, they, the latter days begin in the, with the uh, fulfillment of the uh, 70th seven of Daniel. When that dangling seventh starts to come, and that dangling seven is what we call the Great Tribulation, a time of Jacob's trouble. A lot of people that think we're going to go through the Great Tribulation forget that we were not there for the first 483 years of the time dedicated to Israel, and that last dangling seven, we will not be there. For those of days that are dedicated to the nation Israel, not to the church. Daniel was a Jew. Right. Um, in the verse above, God gives instructions to Hosea to do exactly what he did to the harlot, Israel. Notice that the restoration is complete in the latter days. The picture is sad, but the love is real, and the love gives birth to restoration, such as our God. And I ended it by quoting John 3.16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God might allow you to go to go through hell. Okay. And yeah, if you don't quit some of those sins, young lady, yeah, you, you may have to pay for it. Okay. But I got worse ones on my phone. But it doesn't it, it doesn't mean that he's ever going to give you no mercy. It doesn't. So you're not going to go the low me route. You're not going to go not my people low me route. You have God's mercy, and we already have God's restoration. Okay, nothing can change that. Read the remaining part of, of uh, Romans chapter eight. For I am persuaded that nothing, neither life nor death, uh, goes on. 
height and depth um, can keep and separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus says, I've never lost a single one. So, you're in good shape there, but. Thank you. Um, we're going to continue this cycle throughout Hosea. We're going to go into God's going to tell us a whole bunch of more bad things they do. Uh, and he's going to go back and tell us how he's going to restore them in that day. And that's kind of the story of Hosea. That's the story of actually all the uh, prophets. They, they, they have portions where they, they talk about how bad Israel is, and then here's what God's going to do about it. And, and, and it, we study these because God's already seen this stuff happening. And when we're studying it, we can say, wait a minute, uh, now's my chance to repent. I know we all have here, but uh, that's why God gives us prophecy, so that we can see what he's already seen. And you don't want it. I just so he gives you life to the Lord. Okay. Heaven, Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, as we come to a conclusion here tonight, Lord, thank you for what you're teaching us. Lord, we can see ourselves in this story. We, we can see ourselves as being the ones that you definitely show mercy to. For we were the ones that you would really have said lo humha to us, but we did not have mercy. We would have been the ones, Lord, prior to knowing you, uh, that had committed that all unpardonable sin. That uh, We were those ones. But we're also the ones that you now say we are your people. We are the ones that you have showed mercy to. So Lord, we can see ourselves in the pages of this scripture. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Hey, Wayne, I started a new program. I've, I've already done the book of Acts.